my background is in architecture and theater. It is not in archaeology. And but um, this will work, and I think you're going to really enjoy this evening's presentation. We all heard about the archaeological digs that were going on on the Oxford Plains prior to Walmart's construction, and it sort of stayed in my mind at the McLaughlin Foundation. I'm like, God, I would really like to know what they found. And so around 2000 or 2001, I called the state archaeologist and asked if they knew who had done the dig. And it was Deb Wilson was the response. They gave me Deb's telephone number. We talked. And it took a couple of years to get it going. But two years later, in 2002, Deb presented <coughs> um, a slide presentation at the McLaughlin Garden that was part of a grant from the Maine Humanities Foundation. And tonight's presentation is the continuance of that grant. What we did was submit a grant proposal for Deb to produce slides and a talk um, in two sets, one that she could retain for her own use and one that the community could have um, for use and it's set at the fourth grade level. So this talk has been designed to be um, given to schools or to social organizations, civic organizations, um, at a very easy level. I've never had an archaeological class in my life, and that may be very obvious to you in, in a short time, but we have a couple archaeologists in the group, so if there are any pressing questions, we probably can get the answers met tonight. But this, this talk has been devised so that it should be able to satiate your curiosity about what is under Walmart. Um, and we've given this, the, we've had this three times at the McLaughlin Foundation, and then it's gone out, I think, three or four times to classrooms. And then last summer, we had one of our members at the garden knew about it and asked to take it to a party at their house that night. What fun. So, yes. So, if any of you know of any teachers who would like this um, or any groups who would like to borrow this, it's at the McLaughlin Garden. You're welcome to have it any time. And in fact, with our videographer in the back, if the foundation is not a great place to have this. If it's better to have in a library, it's fine. If this was done for the community. So without further ado, we will begin this wonderful talk prepared by Deb Wilson, archaeologist, called An Ancient Campsite in Oxford, Maine. Paleo-Indians. Sometime around 10,000 years ago, a group of people camped near the Little Androscoggin River in what is now Oxford, Maine. Perhaps they were tired and hungry, so they decided to stay for a while to rest, hunt, and refurbish their tools. They chose a campsite overlooking a river valley where they found signs that caribou had passed. After a week or two, the people moved on, leaving behind a few stone artifacts to mark their stay. Next, please. About 10,000 years after the people left their campsite, the shape of the land had changed little. Can you focus that, Gary? I may be too close to tell, but it's... Oh, yeah. yeah, you'll hear a relief from the whole crowd. <laughs> Thank you. The shape of the land had changed little, but the area, now called Oxford, Maine, was well settled by people of European descent. There were roads, houses, railroad tracks, and stores where people there had been, where, where there had been open land, a river, and a faintly marked game trail. Next, please. Walmart. A large retail, discount retailer planned to establish a new superstore in Oxford, and they chose a location on the east side of the Little Androscoggin River along Route 26. Environmental impact studies, including an archaeological survey, were, were required by the state of Maine before Walmart could begin construction. Next, please. The archaeological survey and phase one study aimed at locating sites in the development area was carried out during the summer of 1993 by archaeologist Deb Wilson, her 11-year-old son Nicholas, and field crew member Alan McIntyre. The archaeologist walked the land and decided to excavate text pits near the margin of the sand plain, which overlooked the little Androscoggin River Valley. And actually, Deb said when she was giving this live that they followed her son Nicholas's lead. So they watched where Nicholas was curious about on the site, and where he stopped and wanted to dig, they went and dug there. <laughs> Next, please. A stone tool fragment, bottom center. This one right here. Does that focus a little bit? Ah, it's fuzzy shirts. A stone tool fragment, 
was found by Nicholas in the very first test pit. Several other test pits produced stool fragments and flakes. Stone chips formed when stool, stone tools were made or sharpened. The artifacts were finely worked and made from exceptionally fine-grained stones of rare occurrence. Archaeologists associate such tools, workmanship, and lithic materials with the people who settled Maine at the end of the last ice age. Now she um, stressed that this was a very lucky find. You know the size of the Walmart site. And Nicholas just went to one place, started digging, and within a very small radius, they began finding artifacts. It was quite fortunate. They could have had their first test digs in other areas, and then they may not have found anything, and this whole project would not have been funded. So, was there any suspicion that there was anything there? There was the, well, they were required by law to do it, so yeah. it, the suspicion wasn't necessary, except she was saying that it looked like a good area. Um, with the sandy soils, there, were, there was a higher like, uh, likelihood that there might be artifacts because there would be drainage, not quite as much acid buildup to deteriorate the artifacts. So that was good. And probably um, at the, as the ice cap receded, um, that sort of a sandy plain would be one of the first areas where you'd start getting vegetation going. And that's what you needed to get going to have um, game come in, because you need plants and then game, and then the humans would follow the game for hunting. So it seemed good to her. Next. Thanks. Native, oh, uh, excellent. Native people lived in Maine for about 11,000 years before the, the arrival of Europeans. The style of tools changed during the long sweep of prehistory, especially the shape of projectile points. Using tool attributes, radiocarbon dates, and other information, Maine archaeologists have defined three major periods of prehistory, Paleo-Indian, Archaic, and Woodland or Ceramic. The tools recovered where Walmart would be built belong to the Paleo-Indian, or earliest period of prehistory. For many years, archaeologists postulated that native peoples arrived in North America solely by way of an ice-free corridor from Asia during the last ice age. Today, this explanation appears to be simplistic, and many archaeologists now think that people may have arrived in North America at different times from diverse locations, including Europe. And I apologize here, that's the end of that paragraph. That sounds like a very complex and interesting story. But it's, that whole story is not part of tonight's lecture, but it deserves further attention, I think. Next, please. However people arrived in North America, they couldn't have settled Maine until mile-thick glacial ice had melted. About 11,000 years ago, only a few chunks of wasted ice were left in Maine, and the land was open for colonization by plants, animals, and finally by people. Um, there's some other Paleo-Indian sites in New England that we'll talk about briefly further south from our site on the Oxford Plains um, really predate the Oxford Plain one, and it's all because of this receding ice cap coming up. We just couldn't get to Maine yet. There wasn't anything to eat. There weren't animals or plants for quite a while. Next, please. After the glacial ice retreated, it took time for vegetation to become reestablished in raw glacial soils. At first, cold, post-glacial conditions encouraged the growth of a treeless, tundra-like vegetation characteristic of Arctic regions. This was the landscape that the first people in Maine encountered about 11,000 years ago. Soon thereafter, forests were established, first in protected lowlands with rich soils, and later at high elevations and in more exposed locations with poorer soils. Next, please. Oh, here they are. It's amazing to think that, they're <laughs> that these critters were on at Walmart at some point. <laughs> Just trying to get those early morning DVD sales. I can you know, <laughs> Animals moved into Maine as soon as the environment could support them. For a while, a number of now extinct species like ma uh, mammoth and mastodon inhabited the area. When Paleo-Indians arrived in the region, these elephant relatives may have been present along, the giant, along with giant beaver, horses, musk, oxen, and caribou. Many more common species of mammals, fish, and birds probably also inhabited Maine at that time. Next. 
first moved into Maine is fascinating, and the archaeological sites where these early peoples camped are extremely rare and important. Therefore, before Walmart could begin construction of their superstore, the Maine Historic Preservation Commission required that the Paleo-Indian site be fully excavated. <coughs> and actually here, Walmart was given a choice. Once artifacts were found on the site, they were given the choice of finding another location for their store or funding a full archaeological dig and Walmart, of course, chose the latter. During the fall of 1993, archaeologist Rick Will joined Deb Wilson, directing a field crew that worked into November to excavate the site. Next, please. Isn't that sharp enough? Ah. The site was mapped like, with, like a piece of graph paper, and excavators dug in squares, recording their finds and screening the sandy soil to find even the smallest artifacts. In this way, the site boundaries were determined, and areas of prehistoric activity were defined by the distribution of artifacts. It is amazing to think that fragments of stone left in the ground more than 10,000 years ago had moved little since that time, but that is what the field crew found. It was really an extraordinary site. Next, please. To, to meet Walmart's development schedule, the archaeologists had to conduct the excavation as quickly as possible. During the fall of 1993, the field crew worked in ever-diminishing daylight hours of all kinds of weather, carefully excavating the site and recovering every bit of available information. Shelters were built to keep the rain and gusty fall winds outside of the site. Next please. By late fall, Frost formed on the pit walls each morning. This was a time when it was easy to imagine the landscape 10,000 or 11,000 years ago. The leaves fell from the trees, revealing the little Androscoggin River Valley descending in broad terraces to a meandering river below. Hawks flew high overhead, crying out at the coming of winter, and hunters could occasionally be seen in pursuit of a deer, as pa just as Paleo-Indians had pursued game a millennia earlier. Next please. Even, oh God, isn't that amazing? Even working into the late fall, the excavation wasn't complete, necessitating a return in the spring of 1994. By that time, Walmart was under construction, and the contractor had enclosed the site area for the excavation in a chain link fence. The archaeologists were now required to wear hard hats in the construction area. The field crew found it strange to excavate the remains of an ancient campsite with trowels inside a fence, while outside the fence, heavy equipment was in use to raise a superstore. Next, please. <coughs> One day, a dark stain, possibly a charcoal-flecked remains of an ancient heart, was observed in the sandy soil pit. Living things, including wood, contain carbon, which decays at known rates once an organism dies. Several laboratories specialize in dating ancient remains, such as such as charcoal, by measuring how much carbon has decayed since the organism died. Hoping to date the archaeological site, samples of the dark soil stain, called a feature, were saved. Next, please. Thanks, Gary. Guess who that is? That's Nicholas. Yeah. Son Nicholas joined Deb Wilson one day to see what transpired since he found the first artifact of the site during the summer of 1993. Nicholas observed the excavation for a while, but he soon decided to construct a cultural layer of his own. For hours, he took sand that once had been settled, that once had, that, that had once been settled by Paleo Indians and would soon support a Walmart, and he created an Egyptian landscape. Rick Will and Deb Wilson eventually decided to name the site after Nicholas, both because he found the first artifact and because of his long-term interest in archaeology. Now, there's um, a wonderful publication. I believe it costs about $9 to purchase, and it's called Origins, Origins and Ancestors, Investigating New England's paleo Indians. <coughs> and this was part of an exhibit at the um, Robert S. Peabody Museum at Phillips Andover Academy. 
And this goes into three Paleo-Indian sites in New England, early, middle, and late periods. And the late period example used for the exhibit and in this publication is the Nicholas site. Mm -hmm. So the Walmart site is famous in, <laughs> in archaeological terms. It really led to some fantastic finds. Next, please. Finally, <clears throat> is that sharp enough for everybody? Get in there. Finally, the archaeologists determined that the Nicholas site was fully excavated and that Walmart could build its loading dock where the remains of an ancient campsite had preserved a story for millennia. The artifacts forming the story had been excavated and it was time to analyze what had been found. In archaeology, the analysis phase of research is often more time consuming than the excavation itself. Artifacts must be washed and studied. Charcoal must be removed from soil samples and sent to a lab for dating. If small bits of burned bone are recovered, specialists try to identify the species of animal represented to understand what people ate a long time ago. Distribution maps are made of the finds so that the archaeologists can identify the location of dwellings and special activity areas. Once the site is analyzed, the information is compared with similar sites to enhance our understanding of that period of prehistory. Next, please. More than 5,000 artifacts were recovered from the Nicholas site. The majority were waste flakes, but several hundred tools and tool fragments were also found. Projectile points, like the ones pictured, are the most time-sensitive artifacts recovered at prehistoric archaeological sites. The Nicholas site projectile points were studied and measured to see where they fit into the timeline of the Paleo-Indian period. Next, please. Archaeologists, yeah, and this is right from that Robert S. Peabody booklet um, from the museum exhibit. Archaeologists in the Northeast recognize three phases of Paleo-Indian period, early, middle, and late, on the basis of stylistic attributes of the projectile points and other information. Deb Wilson and Rick Will determined that the Nicholas site points were late in the sequence. Other archaeologists in the region accepted this determination, and the Nicholas site projectile points became the defining type for the latest phase of Paleo-Indian period in New England. Next, please. Although, <laughs> although all of the Nicholas site points were small compared with earlier Paleo-Indian sites, this one was exceptionally small and was classified a miniature point. Many Paleo-Indian sites in the Northeast have produced miniature points, which are thought to represent children's toys or perhaps hunting charms. Next, please. Uh, this slide depicts the process of making a projectile point. Stone that breaks with a conchoidal fraction is shaped with a hammer stone or an antler billet into the desired shape. A skilled flint napper, I love that term now, I'm going to use that a lot. You flint napper, you. <laughs> a, skilled, a skilled flint napper can make a finely crafted projectile point in less than one hour. Next, please. A few projectile points preforms, this is what these are called preforms, they haven't quite reached their finish stage, or partially formed points were found at the Nicholas site as were thousands of waste flakes that were created as the points were shaped. These artifacts provide insight into one activity that was carried out at the site, the manufacture of projectile points. In, in imagining this, we might visualize broken points being removed from their paths, hear the sounds of glassy stone being struck, and feel the satisfaction when a new tool is ready for use in obtaining much needed gain. Next, please. End scrapers were the most abundant tool type found at the Nicholas site, with 31 specimens recovered. It is likely that end scrapers were hafted on handles and were used to shape implements out of wood. Next, please. This end scraper, found in two pieces, appears to have broken before it was finished. As the projectile points incomplete, broken tools such as this one tell us that people probably camped at the Nicholas site for a while, at least long enough to replace worn out tools, and probably perform some of the tasks that caused the tools to become worn or broken. Next, please. And that's 
Thank you. These tools are called side scrapers because they were sharpened and used on the side of a piece of stone rather than on the end. Side scrapers have asymmetric knife-like edges that were used for a variety of tasks. Next, please. As shown in this slide, archaeologists think that one, one use of side scrapers was in skinning and butchering game. When the cutting edge became dull for use, the tool was resharpened until eventually it became too small to be effective and was replaced. Unlike end scrapers that were probably placed in a handle, side scrapers appear to have been handheld tools. Yes, then you have concave scrapers. Now, to me, that doesn't look like a tool at all. <laughs> I was amazed when I first saw this slide. These are concave scrapers, and only a few of them were recovered at the Nicholas site. Microscopic studies of these tools indicate that the concavities were used to shape hard substances such as wood and possibly antler and bone. Next, please. This is what it may have looked like to see a concave scraper in use. In this case, the tool is being used to, to shape the haft of a spear. Of a spear. <coughs> Next. These are tips. These are tools that were shaped like a, with a tip at one end. Tipped tools. Some with fine, tiny tips and others with broad, substantial tips are common, commonly found on Paleo Indian sites. Such tools might have had several uses, from puncturing holes in animal hides to inscribing tattoos, like those adorning native people of early historic period. Six tip tools were recovered at the Nicholas site. And next, please. This is what it might have looked like to see a tip tool being used to cut a piece of hide. I think you just pick those up at those Michael's craft stores. <laughs> town. That's where you go to get those. Next, please. Here is an example of a tip tool being used to puncture a hide. In the West, where preservation is better than it is in Maine, bone needles have been recovered on Paleo Indian sites. Archaeologists postulate that Paleo Indians made tailored clothing by cutting pieces of hide with a stone knife or side scraper, puncturing stitching holes in the hide with a tip tool, and sewing the pieces together with a bone needle. Next please. Abrading stones. Not all tools recovered at the Nicholas site were made from fine grained stones. These are abrading stones and they might have been missed during the excavation if the sandy Oxford Plains soils contained any rocks at all. Once the rocks were covered at the site were studied under the microscope, linear, abrasions, mar linear abrasion marks were identified on the surface of these stones. She said it was really a, a rare thing for her in her archaeological experience in Maine to be on such a dig where there were that very little had been disturbed below the surface and where there really were no stones below the surface save those that turned out to be artifacts. Quite unusual. Okay, next please. Thanks. Abrading stones were used to prepare the edges of stone tools for flaking. By abrading the stone edges, flint nappers created striking platforms <laughs> that served to control the size and direction of the flaked removals. Braiding stones were also used to shape bone tools and for many other applications. Next, please. This looks more of what we see on the surface, I think. These small rolled granite cobbles recovered at the Nicholas site are hammer stones that were also employed in the flake stone tool making process. Each hammer stone has a faceted side that was created as the tool was repeatedly used to strike the stone being shaped into a tool. Next, please. And this is an illustration of a hammer stone in use on a block of stone called a core. Cores are chunked of fine grain are chunks of fine grained stone shaped in such a manner that flint nappers could easily extract preforms from them and formal tools such as projectile points and end scrapers. Both hammer stones and core fragments were recovered at the Nicholas site. Next. Hammer stones were also used to break bones for marrow excavation or to obtain pieces of bone that could be shaped into bone tools. In Maine, bones are never pre preserved on archaeological sites as old as the Nicholas site unless they have been burned in a very hot fire. Called calcine bones, 
burn bones are very small and hard to identify to species. 41 small calcined bone fragments were recovered at the Nicholas site. They had highly eroded surfaces and could only be identified as medium-sized mammal long bone fragments. Um, Deb was suspicious or maybe being conservative and said they were probably caribou. We couldn't go ahead and say that they were woolly mammoths or mastodons. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be conservative with caribou. While on the subject of burning, the charcoal recovered from the dark soil stain, remember that one slide earlier on, was sent to a lab for dating with disappointing results. It returned a date of 6,600 years ago, much too young to date a, a Paleo-Indian occupation, but possibly documenting an ancient forest fire instead. Next, please. We do not understand, this is getting hard to read these for me. We do not understand the use of all artifacts recovered at the Nicholas site. This is a piece of graphite enclosing um, a little bit of black tourmaline. Although the graphite found with several smaller pieces shows no wear, it may have been intended as a source of pigment. It may also have had some sort of spiritual significance. Um, Deb said this was a very unusual find. Um, the other Paleo-Indian sites in New England had not found anything like this, so there was sort of no analysis record or track of what this may have been used for. Next, please, Gary. We like the light ones. Let's see. <laughs> the distribution of artifacts at a site is an important aspect of archaeological analysis. Is that sharp enough for everyone to see? Pretty good. This graphite. Um, this graphic excuse me, shows that most artifacts at the Nicholas site were found within 30 centimeters, about one foot, of the ground surface. There are two reasons for this. First, soils in the area have been stable since the end of the last ice age. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> I bet we wouldn't have paid our taxes then, David. Even then, you know, there is continuities of time. Our soil doesn't move. We don't have any money. We don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> First soils in the area have been stable since the end of the last ice age. No soil has been removed or added. Second, particles like stones and prehistoric artifacts move vertically in the soil column only in, it, only in its chemically and biologically active upper levels, which are within a foot or two of the ground surface. The vertical distribution of artifacts provides one measure of the site's integrity. And so here with this graph, wherever it's darkened is where, in terms of depth, they found most of their artifacts. You can see it's very, it's, it's um, very uh, standard. Next, please. The horizontal, now, so this is four small sites on the overall site that they excavated. The horizontal distribution of artifacts provides another measure of a site's integrity, four small concentrations of cultural material were identified at the Nicholas site, which included 256 square meters of excavation. The spacing of the concentrations and their semicircular orientation indicates that they represent four distinct areas of prehistoric activity, possibly four dwellings. The clear patterning of the concentrations provides another piece of information. The site was probably occupied just once, because if it had been repeatedly occupied, overlapping activity areas would be experienced. Um, she's being very conservative in this, in this report. What her conclusions were was we basically had four tent-like, imagine um, sort of non-permanent structures, tent, teepee sorts of structures. Teepee's too modern a word. Um, in this concentric circle. So perhaps four family groups. Next, please. Once the integrity of each concentration of cultural material was confirmed, the distribution of artifacts within them was examined in an effort to seek patterns that would reveal some aspect of human behavior. One particularly interesting pattern at the Nicholas site was the identification of a projectile point near the east margin of, east, of each concentration. The projectile points have great significance in hunting cultures, and many Native American dwellings have an eastward orientation towards the rising sun. It is possible that a projectile point was placed in the doorway of each dwelling at the Nicholas site, for luck or some other reason we can only imagine. Um, Deb had said that while she didn't print it, they 
but more and more as they worked at this, at the analysis of this site, they began to believe it was a winter, it has been a winter site. The doorways of these structures were oriented toward the rising sun, towards the east. Um, and the reason that it was a winter site, I'm trying to remember why she said this. We'll get, to, I think it's in here. We'll, it'll, it will become clear. <laughs> oh, because summer sites are messier. They stay in the summer sites, they would tend to stay in the summer sites longer, and there would be a lot more artifacts, and they wouldn't have been, um, the distribution wouldn't have been so clear in these wonderful rings, the four loci that she discovered. Next please. Back to stones. <laughs> the lithic materials used by Paleo-Indians to make tool provide a wealth of behavioral information. Only the finest materials, including cherts, which are fine-grained, colorful materials of sedimentary origin and very fine-grained, glassy, volcanic materials were used to make Paleo-Indian tools. Such stones occur but rarely, but Paleo-Indians found their sources and seem to have walked long distances to obtain them. At the Nicholas site, most of the stone tools were made from a glassy, volcanic material from the upper Androscoggin River Valley near Berlin, New Hampshire. This slide depicts minority materials, which include Monsungan shirt, the dark red shirt, this one up here in the center. Monsungan shirt, that's from northern Maine. Um, the other materials are from unconfirmed sources. The pinkish vein stone may be Saugus jasper from Massachusetts. The gray green material may be a western Vermont shirt. And the quartz crystal may have been obtained from a pegmatitic formation in the Oxford Plains area. Next, please. This map, this map shows the location of some Paleo-Indian sites, isolated artifact finds, and known lithic sources in New England. The site locations are identified by the large red and green triangles. So here's the Nicholas site is right here. Some other key ones much further south. And they're earlier. This is, as I was saying earlier, this is the latest, the latest site. Um, the site locations are identified by the large red and green triangles, isolated finds by the small red triangles, and the stone sources are identified by the blue circles. And I don't know if you can see those. There's one here, here, here up in northern Maine and down in Massachusetts. Oh, and then we get one up here. Even then, we were going to Canada for things. Oh my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because Paleo-Indians were a colonizing population, archaeologists do not think that the trade systems were established during the time they dwelt in the region. Instead, they, it seems likely that they obtained stones in widely separated locations by walking to the sources. On this basis, it appears that people who have occupied the Nicholas site had recently obtained stones from the vicinity of Berlin, New Hampshire. They also appear to have traveled more widely, possibly to Vermont, Massachusetts, and northern Maine, and perhaps much further, or not long before they arrived in the Oxford area. And this is that sort of um, distribution of stone types um, in these Paleo-Indian um, archaeological sites is common to all these New England archaeological sites. They all had stones from these sites that are marked in blue circles. They, walked a lot. <laughs> and they knew where these sites were. It's not like there were signs there. They knew. Next, please. We have now completed our brief overview of the ancient archaeological site that was found where Walmart is now located in Oxford. To summarize, let's consider what we know of the site after its full excavation and analysis. We know that people camped along the margin of the Little Androscoggin River Valley sometime around 10,000 years ago about 1,000 years after the first people arrived in Maine. The Nicholas site inhabitants were Paleo-Indians, some of the first inhabitants of Maine. At the Nicholas site, people carried out activities that resulted in the use and discard of stone tools, as well as the manufacture of new tools. There have been four dwellings at this site, which were spaced in a semicircle facing east. If four to six people lived in each dwelling, as many as 24 people may have lived there. The distribution of artifacts within concentrations indicated cold weather occupation when activity was largely confined to the interior of the dwelling. Whatever drew people to the Nicholas site, they seem never to have returned. A 
conclusion drawn by the non-overlapping distribution of artifact concentrations. Next, please. We have little direct information about what people ate while living in the Nicholas site. The few calcine bones recovered during the excavation are long bones of a medium-sized mammal. Caribou bones have been identified at other Paleo-Indian sites in New England, and it is possible that these animals provided one source of sustenance for Nicholas site residents. The excavation and analysis of many Paleo-Indian sites in a region provides archaeologists with the information necessary to infer behavior in the past and ultimately to reconstruct ancient life ways. Next, please. The discovery, excavation, and analysis of the Nicholas site provides an example of why federal and state laws requiring an archaeological review prior to development are so important. Out of such work, we obtain information about the past that would otherwise be lost. In addition, data from ancient sites is often used to inform studies about the long-term climate trends and the evolution of the main landscape. Finally, in taking the long view that our lives represent but a mere moment in time, such projects honor both our privilege and our responsibility for ensuing that the footsteps from the past are preserved for future generations to know. That's the end of Deb's talk. Okay.